mathematical research, and then we did uh, a lot of very interesting and novel work in uh, termination proving solutions. So, could you also tell us uh, what happens after termination? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation, by the way. So, um, the the um, the talk is based on the following assumption, that termination provers now will forever improve. Right? So there's going to be people working on termination provers. And every year they're going to get a little bit better. And so the question is, what do we do with them beyond proving termination? And um, so I'm going to uh, tell you about some work that I've been involved in uh, that uses the techniques from termination proving to prove temporal logic of, of, of programs and, and other systems. But I can't, I can't help myself but just give you a little update on termination. Uh, I know I would say that we can prove termination now, what, but just, just two slides. So I, I previously worked on this cool tool called Terminator, um, and um, it's what's interesting about Terminator is that is it explored the interaction between finding supporting invariants and finding termination arguments. It was based on safety proving tools that I'd worked on previously, and the problem with Terminator is it never really worked. Um, so, I mean, it kind of worked, but it didn't really. And it was every, every design decision we made was actually the wrong one. Um, and the tools on which it was based w were horrible. And many things have improved since then. So there's a new tool called T2. Are you, are you going to withdraw all the papers? No, no. <laughs> no. I mean, it worked. It worked. It, the, the, the best, the, the, the way to become uh, successful is to be first and really bad at it, right? So then, 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 then you can improve on it. So there's a new tool called T2. Um, which is rewritten from scratch. It uses a new underlying safety prover. It's much more reliable. Um, well, I've, uh, uh, l l let me tell you what, I, what we've already done about T2. Um, and it re what's, what, a couple of interesting things about it. It replaces the trans trans uh, transition invariance, which is what we were using before for a more standard termination arguments. And it also combines um, techniques from the, the, what's called the dependency pairs approach. And uh, both of these techniques make things much faster. And one thing that people were asking me for a long time is, can I give them the source code to Terminator? And I'm giving you the source code to, to T2, if you'd like it. So it's available online. Um, there's a couple of papers that have come out this year which are, which are of interest. So this paper um, is about how we don't use the a uh, transition invariance approach. Instead, we use standard lexicographic ranking functions, but we still find them iterator iteratively. Um, and then another paper is about how we combine techniques from the dependency pairs approach from, this, from rewrite systems um, together with Terminator, and we can make, now we have a tool that is better than, than the, both, the, the best of the both worlds. So, so anyways, that's, that's, what's about, that's what's going on in, in termination proving. But, uh, but we're gonna go beyond that. So, so uh, what I was going to tell you about is uh, two, two approaches. So one uh, paper that comes from CAV11, one pa paper comes from um, uh, POPL11, and uh, the one describes how to prove CTL of programs, and the other describes how to prove LTL of programs. And then if there's, a bit of, if there's time, I'm going to tell you a bit about how we also can prove um, uh, liveness properties of biological systems. But what's really nice is that Andre's talk yesterday covered the CTL. So now I don't need to talk about that. So basically, we had a technique for proving CTL, and it's very complicated. And what Andre has done is captured it in just one slide. Yeah? So this one slide he gave yesterday captures how we did uh, CTL as expressed as a constraint system. So I won't go into detail on that. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do, and I missed Moshi's talk, so I don't know what he said, but I can, I can imagine what he said. I'm going to give you just a, a quick uh, temporal logic refresher. In fact, what I'm going to... He said Terminator was good. Oh, well. <laughs> mm. So I'm just going to give you an example that demonstrates the difference between linear time logics and branching time logics. I would imagine Moshe said something about this, but I'm going to say a little bit more. Um, so l linear time logics are in some sense trace-based. They, they talk about the executions of a, of a system when you think about all of the uh, runs of a system in some sense. Uh, and uh, in some sense, the properties are intuitive, but um, they're traditionally thought of as they're more difficult to prove because of the underlying techniques. Branching time logics are state-based. The properties are a little bit trickier to understand, but in some sense they're easier to prove because they're state-based. So you think about sets of states and transitions between states as opposed to um, uh, sets of traces. Okay, and I'm going to give you uh, an example program that demonstrates the difference between CTL and LTL. Okay, so this is a program that 
sets some variable x to true. Okay? And then this represents non-determinism. Right? So whenever we hit this, um, this uh, head of the loop, we don't know if we're going to go into the loop or not. Right? So during the proof, we have to consider both possible cases. Okay? Then the program, so, so maybe the program runs forever here in this loop. Um, or maybe it pops out, sets x to false, sets it back to true, and then runs forever in, this, in the second loop. And so the question is, uh, does x eventually become true and stay true forever? Okay, let me give you a moment to think about that. So hold your hand up if you think the answer is yes. And hold your hand up if you think the answer is no. Uh-huh, okay, very good. So it, the, the, the answer to the question is it depends on which logic you're expressing it, right? So, um, so in LTL, the property fgx, which is saying it, x eventually becomes true and stays true, is valid. Uh, and the reason is, is if you think of all of the traces of the system, right? So think of what traces are there. There's the trace where you stay in this loop forever. And in that trace, it, it is true because x started off its life as true, and then we just stayed in this loop forever. Um, then there, there's the other case where uh, we go through the loop some finite number of times, and then we set x to false, but then we set it back to true, and then we run forever. And so in all of those, uh, for any number of iterations of the first loop, it will become true, x will become true, and it will stay true forever. So in, both, but sort of in all possible runs of the system, uh, the property is true. But in CTL, the morally equivalent property, AF, AGX, is, is not valid. So the problem here is, is that AF, AG, what it's saying is, can you, so AF, AG, is saying, can you find some frontier, some set of states that you eventually reach? And from that set of states, now X is true and stays true forever. Right? So the AF is like, do you get to the frontier? And then the AG, AX is from that frontier, is, it, does, is, X invariant, is X being true invariant? And it turns out there is no set of states that you eventually reach in this program such that from that point on, uh, X is true and stays true. So let's look at that. So in CTL, we're thinking about the, the, the program as a, as a tree. So whenever we hit some non-determinism, right? So when we, for example, we're here and we don't know if we're going to go into the loop or out of the loop then we express that with some branching. Right, so this is the case where we went out of the loop um, and then we run forever. Right? But this is the case where we go in when we stay in the loop another time and then maybe we pop out again. Um, and the question is now, can we find some frontier? Can we find some set of states that we eventually reach and then from those set of states on, uh, X is true and stays true? And it turns out we can't. And the problem is, um, that if we stay in the first loop, we can run forever, but at any point pop out and set x to false. And so for that reason, we can't prove AG, uh, I'm sorry, AF, AG, X, the property isn't true when we're done. Okay? So that's the difference between uh, LTL and CTL. Okay, I've said all that. Great. So, right, so... I was going to tell you about how to prove CTL. Uh, I have a very complicated uh, procedure, right, with many uh, details. But Andre uh, has now covered it and expressed it much, much more, much more nicely in terms of uh, his system, the Sausage Factory. So we won't talk about that. I'm just, but if you'd like to know all the gory details, I can tell you all about it after the after the talk. I'm just going through it to give you, okay, to give you an idea of, of uh, how, how nice his system was uh, by uh, uh, expressing it as constraints. Okay, so let's, prove, let's talk about LTL now. So well now, the, the thing about LTL is if you, have, um, if you have a termination prover, it turns out not to be hard, too hard to make a termination prover that supports fairness. And it turns out that if you support fair termination, you can express LTL as a question of fair termination, and um, you're done. Uh, but with the existence of a CTL prover, this paper that I'm going to tell you about now, um, uh, uh, we look at a, a, a different way 
to prove uh, LTL using the CL2, CTL prover. Um, I'm not going to explain what fair termination is, but I can, I can do after the talk. <laughs> I'm just saying, what I'm saying is there's another way of doing it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about our way, and then I'll show you some comparisons, but I don't want to tell you about the old way. You should know about it, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, the, the approach I'm going to tell you about is based on uh, this paper by uh, Abadi and Lamport, which, which introduces the idea of prophecy variables. Okay. So... Um, Hmm? Okay, yeah. What's that? Okay, as, as Andre said, uh, what, what was the quote, Andre? Uh, everything's been said, just not by everybody. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's look at this program. So I'm going to just modify it slightly. So the, the bit in yellow has been added. Okay, and I'm going to um, now describe what's going on. So I have a new variable, which um, I can assign, it begins its life with either a natural number or some other, some other value, bottom. Okay. And then inside the loop, on every iteration, um, either uh, row, is not equal to, uh, row is not equal to zero, and we uh, decrement row, and when uh, row is um, equal to bottom, then row minus one just stays bottom, or we leave the loop and we assume that row is equal to zero. Okay? And so the assume is this weird instruction that um, only allows execution across it if the uh, predicate is true. Otherwise, the, the execution didn't happen. Okay? And what's interesting about this program is that it's trace equivalent to the original program. So, so ask a question about any trace of the original program without the yellow code, and that um, th that will hold of the program with the yellow code, and vice versa. So this, the set of traces are equivalent, so long as you don't ask questions about row. But the CTL property holds of this program. So we now can prove AFAGX of this program, and I'll show you how. Okay. So what's interesting about this program is that the, if you look at the, the tree, that represents the program's execution, the non-determinism has moved. Instead of, at every iteration of the, the loop, we make a non-deterministic decision, we've actually now moved in the non-determinism to the, to the initial assignment of row. So now, we have this massive branching at the beginning, where we assign different potential values, and then from that point on, everything is, not, is actually deterministic. So rather than this, um, uh, system, we get this. Okay, and then here's the frontier. So it turns out that we do eventually reach this set of states. So the set of states where um, uh, row is equal to bottom, or the program counter is equal to L4. So I'll, I'll put the program back up so, I can, so you can see what that looks like. So either we choose bottom, right? And now we stay in this loop forever. So if we've chosen bottom, then um, we're never allowed to leave the loop because rho can't, can't equal uh, zero. And thus, we must go into the loop. Rho uh, doesn't equal to zero, and we keep decrementing it, but it just stays bottom, so we stay there forever. Um, or... Uh, we choose rho to be some uh, positive number, but now on um, every iteration of the loop, we're going to decrement rho. We're going to get closer and closer to zero, and we'll eventually reach zero, and then we'll be forced to leave the loop. Then rho will equal to zero, and then we'll get to here. So, so either I, we, we, we will eventually reach the set of states where rho is equal to bottom, or the program counter is equal to L4. And from that set of states, you can now prove that X is true and stays true forever. So it's kind of this magical thing where we've, we've taken a program, tried to prove a property of it, it didn't hold, we added extra, extra information and we, that basically moved the non-determinism around, and now we're able to prove the property. And morally speaking, the new program is equivalent to the old program, if you think about programs and traces. What's that? Jason. 
Trace equivalent, yeah. It's not by similar. But I said morally, morally speaking. But by sim my dad doesn't understand by simulation, but he understands traces, right? Like if you explained it to non, non okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I said more, more, morally speaking, they're equivalent, yeah. And trace, they're trace equivalent. So that's, I find that quite curious. So, um, is it sort of surprising that this happens. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let me skip ahead now through my slow slides. Um, so the trick then now is to find rho. With that, so that paper I mentioned before by Abadi and Lamport, the result was pretty amazing. So they said, I'm going to paraphrase in, in, in CTL and say something that's sort of morally true, but there, there are some technical, technical details that we would need to go through. But basically they're saying, if you're trying to prove something via simulation relations, right? trying to prove that two systems are trace equivalent but using simulation, that won't always work. There are cases where it's not going to work. But they say that there always exists a prophecy variable and a history variable that if you add it into the system, now, the, now it will work. So it's a, it's a quite a beautiful result. Okay, so, so what we're going to do in this, in this work is we're going to try and approximate LTL with ACTL. And we're going to sort of assume that that works most of the time. But in the cases where it doesn't work, then we're going to um, remove the problematic non-determinism using introducing um, uh, prophecy variables. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to do that based on failed counterexamples to ACTL. And again, we'll assume that we have now a CTL prover and, and, and Andre has one and I have one. Okay, so here's the procedure. Um, so we're going to take a, our system that we're trying to prove something of and here's the property we're trying to prove. And the first thing we do is we approximate it uh, in CTL. And this is sort of the natural thing. You, you walk over the structure of the uh, temporal formula that we're trying to prove, and we, whenever we see a G, we put a, an AG there. And whenever we see an F, we put an AF. Right? So we just walk over it and, and um, turn it into CTL. And there's some, there's some things about uh, negation which, which we don't need to talk about here. Okay, so then the next thing we do is we determinize. And in the first time around, determinize actually doesn't do anything, so don't worry about it. So basically, this system and this system, first time around this loop, are equivalent. Okay. Now we try and, in, in, in ACTL, we try and prove that the property holds. So the approximation of the original LTL property holds. And if we succeed, then we're done. Okay. But if we fail, then we're going to get a counterexample. And in the example I showed you before, the counterexample is a big tree, and we're going to represent that as a graph. So the, this graph is a counterexample to the CTL property not holding of that program. And it's saying, hey, you can, as much as you want, go this way, and at any time pop out and set expect to false. So this is the counterexample. Um, And maybe this counterexample, in some sense, represents a real LTL counterexample. So if we, could, if we could walk all the paths of this graph at the same time, simultaneously, and for, and for them all to represent the same trace to the program, then it would be a real counterexample to LTL. So let's try and do that. So let's just walk, symbolically walk this counterexample. So let's start it off at L0. And if we're at L0, then we're at this command. Okay. So now we go to L1. That's fine. So we can do that both in the code and in the counterexample. And now we need to, we have some branching. So we're supposed to go to both L2 and L3 at the same time. And that's not going to be possible in our program. So this, to walk all possible paths through this graph, you actually need to go to different parts of the code. Thus, it doesn't represent the same uh, trace through the program, and thus it represents a spurious counterexample, an LTL. And so then we're going to do something. Okay. So now we're going to refine. So the idea of refinement is to, um, is to characterize the non-determinism in the system that got us into trouble. So if uh, a program is deterministic, there's actually no difference between L LTL and ACTL. But the non-determinism in the program 
um, can, can cause the, 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 the technique to fail. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find that non-determinism and express it and then use prophecy variables to move the, the non-determinism into the state space. Okay. So what Refine does is it um, uh, symbolically walks that uh, counterexample as we did um, uh, a few slides ago and discovers that the non-determinism that we need to pay attention to is um, as when PC equals L1, do we go to L3 or not? And so this um, is something we call a decision predicate. And I've been really lazy and just taken a screenshot of the paper about decision predicates, and I'll just, I'll just read it to you. So a decision predicate is, is represented as a pair of first-order logic formulae, A and B, where A defines when we care in some sense, so it's the, the, the presupposition. And B characterizes the choice that we make when the presupposition holds. So um, basically, it allows us to, to distinguish between A to B and A to not B. And we can then look at a, trans, uh, at a transition in the system and ask, did it go A to, to B or A to not B? And that's what our decision predicate is. And, and we're going we're gonna to now, um, I, won't say, I won't talk about that. So then. Um, uh, but when I find a, a new decision predicate using this refinement strategy, I add it in. Right? So basically, I have a set of decision predicates. That started off as the empty set, and now I've, I've added in a new decision predicate, and now this determinized procedure does something a little bit more interesting. So what determinized is doing is it's going to take this decision predicate, this set of decision predicates, which are, which are characterizing the non-determinism in the system that got us into trouble in the past, and we're going to symbolically move the non-determinism into the state space. So now I can tell you uh, in a little more detail what, the, what Rho really represented. The Rho is the number of A to B transitions that will be taken until we see an A to not B transition. So imagine you set rho to 20. Then what rho is representing is that we're going to be we're going to force the system to take 20 A to B transitions, and on the 21st time around, we're going to force it to go A to not B. So this is what determinized looks like. So we take uh, a system and the set of decision predicates, and we're going to new, return a new system where the state space is the same as before, but for each decision predicate, we're going to add a, natural, uh, a variable representing a natural number together with bottom. And the set of initial states, and this is, actually turns out to be very crucial, the set of initial states is the same as the old set of initial states together with all possible choices. Right? So basically, all, for all possible natural numbers and bottom, the new prophecy variables could be, could be initialized to those values. And then in the system, we can take a transition from a state to a new state if in the old system we could take the analogous transition. And then for each decision predicate pair, uh, one of the following holds. Or, I'm sorry, all, all of them hold. Um, if we're in an A state, so this is a state where we care, and rho is equal to bottom, then we're forced to go to a B state in the transition, and rho stays bottom. Right, so this is the case where we, we initialized rho to bottom, and we're saying you're always going to go A to B, A to B. If we're in an A state and rho is some positive number, then we're going to take a B transition, but we're going to decrement rho. If we're in an A state and rho is now equal to zero, now we're forced to take the not B transition, and then we reinitialize rho. And then if we're not in an A state, we don't care and everything stays the same. So this is the presupposition. Right? So, so in that case, we're just leaving it alone. We're just waiting for A to hold. And so that's determinized. Um, and so, again, morally speaking, if I took the, 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 the transition relation representing that program and tried to implement in code that transformation with determinize, this is effectively what I would get. Because it's saying... Um, 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 so he, here we've initialized it 
And now at the particular program locations, I've added the assumes which implement the, um, whether or not we've taken an A to, B, A, to, A to B transition or an A to not B transition. Okay, and that's the, that's the, that's the method. So now let's look at how it performed. So um, I'm comparing against a tool that Moshe and I worked on previously, which was based on, on uh, and, and, and Andre also on, on fair termination. So this is the, this is the column for the old tool, the traditional approach, and this is the column for the, the new approach. I applied it to um, some code from device drivers, from, some code from uh, PostgreSQL, some code from Apache, some toy examples, and so on. And here's the shapes of the properties that we're proving. Uh, here's the run times um, and the results. I'll leave that up for a moment for you to parse it. Um, I'm sorry, say again? Um, I don't remember where that comes from. I can look it up. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so let's look at the run times. So overall, so this is a this is a funny thing. So I've I've told you about this approach, and my hope is we never need to use it, right? So this this approach where we do refinement of the decision predicates. I'm hoping that the heuristic of this technique is based on the idea that 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 typically we won't we won't need to use it. Typically, ACTL will approximate. LTL, and, we'll, and we won't need to find a decision predicate. So when we needed to find a decision predicate, actually slow, performance might be a little bit slower, but maybe we won't need it. Okay? So here, this is the number of decision predicates we needed to find. So typically, actually, we didn't need to refine. The, this approximation of LTL using CTL typically worked. And in those cases, you'll see the, um, the performance is quite a bit better. Right, so this case, for example, or this case, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this case. So in cases where, we, where, where the over approximation using ACTL, when that worked, things were great. And in cases where we needed to find a decision predicate, that's in, in those cases, typically my technique was slightly slower. Oh, another interesting thing here. So, this is the number of pieces of the termination argument I need to find, basically the number of ranking functions. And it's interesting to compare the number of ranking functions you need to find using this approach and the old approach. So what's going on here is in the old approach, basically everything is reduced to one question of termination. So we, we take the property we're trying to prove, we do a bunch of munging on it, we take the program, we combine them in some way, and then we're left with one question of termination. And um, in that approach, the termination question that needs to be answered is actually quite a bit more difficult. Whereas in the new approach, what's happening is we approximate LTL with CTL. So whenever you see an F, that turns into an AF. And the AF may be nested. In the, in the property. So now we really only need to pull out the termination proving mechanism when we actually see an AF. So, so, so if you see two or three AFs in the property, little local term, termination limits are being proved, but not termination of the entire system. And in, 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 in that setting, it turns out the, the termination questions that are being asked are, are considerably simpler. GFP. Oh, so <clears throat> there's also differences just with or, right? So or means something different. And so there's um. I have to look at it, but um, there were cases I was often surprised when we need to find decision predicates. But look. 
Okay, let's look into it. Okay, um, what's, how much time do I have, by the way? Okay, great. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about um, an, a different application to biology. So um, it turns out that, let's say that you're a pharmaceutical researcher. It turns out you need termination provers. It turns out you need liveness proving, which came as quite, quite a surprise to me. So it turns out that, um, let's say you're a pharmaceutical researcher and you're trying to come up with a cure for... Uh, um, Yeah, yeah. In a sense, uh, so imagine you're trying to come up with a cure for leukemia, so or skin cancer. So what is skin cancer? It's the inability of the mechanism in the skin to to regrow for it, that mechanism to terminate. Right. So so in some sense, the, the you have so five layers of of skin cells, and they're. Um, uh, the, the pieces inside the skin cells are communicating with each other, right? There's like uh, genes and there's uh, little communications between the genes and the cells and so on. And the, um, when, when you have cancer, what's happening is that the mechanism that's, that's regenerating just keeps regenerating even though it should stop. Right? And something like a device driver, so device drivers are designed to respond to events and eventually stop responding to events. Right? There's a network packet comes in, it responds to the event, it puts something in a queue, and it goes away. You, you, you need the device driver to eventually stop responding. It's the same thing with skin or same thing with leukemia. So the, the mechanism for responding to an event just keeps responding. So um, what a pharmaceutical researcher is doing is that they're taking the, uh, a, a representation of the system. They're trying to discover a modification to the system that they could, that they could, the, the change that they could make using using pharmaceutical techniques, such that that mechanism now terminates, whereas it didn't terminate before. So this is um, a, a tool that I've built with Moshe and with uh, Jasmine Fisher and some others at Microsoft Research that allows. Uh, biologists to model the genetic regulatory pathways between cells and uh, we have a number of nodes and communications between the nodes. Um, this is using a formalism that's quite common for biologists and now we want to take this system and basically prove termination. It's not quite termination but I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, and then what the biologists will do is they'll, they'll say, oh, termination doesn't hold. So then they'll modify some, some of the values in these nodes. So from a computer scientist viewpoint, what this system is, is each, each node is a little thread. Think of it. So a little thread with uh, a state holding element. And on each, on each iteration, it's asking, what are the values of my neighbors? And I'm going to, based on the value of my neighbor, adjust my value. And so it's like, basically, think of like a little, for each one, a little while loop. And it says, hey, what are, the, what are the values of my neighbors? Have some function of that, and then either up my value or down my value, or some sort of adjust my value based on the values of my neighbors. Um, and so really, you can think of this as a very large, but fairly, in some sense, simple concurrent program. And what we're trying to prove is not quite termination, but it's close. It's called something called stabilization. So I'd I don't think I wrote that down. Uh, so stabilization is, um, uh, does there exist a state that we eventually, does there exist a unique state that we eventually reach, and then we stay in that state forever? So basically, does there exist a set of constants such that for each variable in the program, fg variable equals the constant? What's nice about this system uh, in, in, in comparison to computer programs is that in computer programs you have typically shared memory concurrency and thus the number of ways that different threads could communicate is vast. What's nice about these systems is that the, we have a lot of knowledge about how the nodes communicate with each other. Basically every line represents a channel of communication and that's all we need to worry about. So it turns out that, oh and the other nice thing about this that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's not so bad, as opposed to all of memory, right? But, the, but I mean, that's better than memory, right? Um, 
Uh, and the other nice thing is that in these models, the values, the, the, the range of the values is actually quite small. So maybe 10, 20 possible values, right? Um, and so, that, so there are some te techniques we can use that wouldn't normally work. So it turns out that the a, 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 a heuristic that we found that worked quite well was to um, uh, basically walk over the system and for each node, try and prove some lemma of the form FGP, where P is some atomic formula, and we basically use just naive search. So we just ask, does FG um, P uh, X greater than one hold? Does FG X greater than two hold? We just keep trying that. And we try that for all of the nodes. And hopefully, one of them will find some lemma of the, f of the form FGP for one of the nodes. And when that turns out to be true, now we use that mechanism to try and prove something about its neighbor. So imagine if we did find an FGP of some form of one of the neighbors, then we now uh, go to the, the node that's reading the value of the neighbor and then try and prove something. We basically search now on a Q. So we now say, oh, okay. So imagine the FGP held of my neighbor. Now can we find some Q such that FGQ holds? And we iterate this search process and keep trying to refine it and keep trying to refine Q and P. And then hopefully we find constant values such that the whole system eventually converges on those constant values. Um, and, and now we've proved uh, uh, what the biologists are interested in. Again, uh, uh, li li liveness, uh, li liveness property, which in effect is termination. Um, what's difficult about this uh, setting is that biologists are not computer programmers, so they, they um, and, they're, and they're not interested in mathematics or logic. So, um, so when you find a proof and you want to try and communicate the proof back to the biologist, they're not, they don't really understand what you're talking about. So, uh, so, so one uh, project we've been involved in in this setting is to take proofs and try and discover why the systems terminate and to express them to the biologists in a way that's interesting to them and it's helpful to them in their, in their investigations. And also to find counterexamples and express them back to the biologists in a way that's interesting to them and it's helpful to them in their scientific endeavors. And so I've become, uh, much to my surprise, uh, I now have a paper in CHI, this uh, computer-human interface. So I'm now a, uh, an HCI re uh, researcher. Humanist. What's that? You're a humanist. That's right, yeah, I care about people. <laughs> um, and so we have some papers on that if, you, if you're interested in that topic. So um, let me conclude. So the, the assumption is tumor, termination provers are, are just going to get better and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of summarize um, some results with some fake equalities. So, so Terminator was basically a... So I'm not telling you about this, but it's basically... This tool I worked on before called SLAM, um, together with a tool from Andre for rank function synthesis, together with this copy trick, which, which I didn't tell you about. And um, that appears in PLDI. And then T2 is basically the same copy trick, slightly different, together with interpolation. So I'm not using SLAM anymore, I'm using an interpolation-based model checker, together with rank function synthesis, together with uh, uh, an approach from uh, dependency pairs, which comes from the rewrite systems world. Um, ACTL, ACTL is basically T2 on steroids, and that's, that's the part of the talk I didn't tell you about. Um, uh, it, turns also, it turns out also that CTL is basically ACTL plus a tre technique for non-termination. So it turns out that, um, and this sort of showed up in Andre's talk also, that basically if you have an ACTL prover and you have a way of proving non-termination, now you can make a CTL prover. And I can tell you about that result if you'd like to know more about it. And then what I told you about in this talk is the fact that um, ACTL plus prophecy now gives you another way of proving LTL. Um, or you can uh, uh, prove LTL with, with uh, fairness, but it turns out the performance of that is not as good. Um, oh, and, and now for the important bits. So, um, uh, if you're, interested in, if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, we're always looking for interns, PhD student interns, or in some cases, undergrad interns. Um, we pay you quite well, and it's a 12-week process. Um, and so you should contact me if you're interested. interested. And another thing is I have a, a postdoc. At, so I'm, I'm also at the University, of, uh, University College London. So if you'd like to work on this kind of thing, 
um, uh, as a postdoc for a couple of years, then contact me, and the application deadline is 3rd of November, so you need to apply soon. Okay, so thank you very much. <clears throat> SLAM uses a mechanism for proving safety of infinite state programs that was nice, but there are much better ways of doing it. So it turns out that it's, uh, it's based on the search for predicates and use predicate abstraction. And the problem is, is that this, the mechanisms for, for finding predicates, they never really worked out very well, and interpolation turns out to be way better. And so, particularly in the case of termination, the search for predicates was very difficult. And we had lots of heuristics to try and improve the search for predicates, but that just slowed the mechanism down. Um, and so, terminator was quite, unreli quite unreliable. So it would, on, on, yes, we could get it to work for device drivers, but if you tried to move to, to anything more interesting than device drivers, it typically didn't work. Um, and then with interpolation, the mechan the, the Mechanism for finding inter the available mechanism for finding interpolants are considerably more reliable, and so thus you make more progress. So just switching over to interpolation from SLAM turned out to be much better for the sorts of questions that are posed by the reduction from termination. Now, with the orthodoxies, we may remember we looked at the example of the power of terminating this was kind of branch function in mm -hmm. class. So you know that people is more powerful than the it's not, it's not more powerful. In fact, it's just slightly less powerful because it's no longer finding these disjunctive termination arguments. It's finding lexicographic termination arguments. And there are some cases where um, there is a disjunction of uh, linear termination arguments, but there is no lexicographic linear termination argument. So, but in principle, you could have taken the disjunctive termination argument with the new uh, separation based model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we, uh, that's an option. Yeah, you can, yeah. So if you want to see the difference between uh, the disjunctive versus the lexicographic, you download T2 and there's a little switch and you can see. Um, so I was, I was thinking that the uh, if, if you are not able to prove termination, you, I guess, get some kind of a counterexample. Uh, can you use this counterexample to tell the biologist, like, look, maybe here are the values you want to tweak? Yes, yeah. That, that, yeah. And so you have some way of communicating them, like this is the information. Yeah, that's right. That's actually the easier case because we can show them basically a run, which we then say repeats forever. Um, and so they can look at it. The more difficult case is when the program does terminate, expressing to them why it terminates because they don't really understand ranking functions. And in particular, because these are the biological, bi biological models that we've looked at are finite states. So often a ranking function really would be very helpful. Tell them maybe or guide them in a way like maybe these are the, the things you want to tweak. That's what we're trying to do now. Yeah. One of the biggest problems which I face uh, working with Microsoft is that this program is not terminating, so you just click this to exit now, right? Yeah. So, do you have some kind of uh, research? Your research is being a part of some of this application verifier or something? Uh, so, there's a bunch of work. So there's work on, um, so often the reason the program isn't responsive isn't because it's non-terminating, but it's because it's uh, complexity is bad. And so um, so the device driver writers typically don't care about termination as much as they compare, care, care about complexity. But there's work um, from Microsoft Research and also from um, um, uh, Vienna and other places on automatically discovering the complexity of programs. And basically these techniques, this is a high level view, but you can take these techniques and modify them slightly to automatically discover the complexity of programs. Um, and then there is, there is work, but I'm not involved in it, on uh, discovering dynamically when programs aren't terminating and killing them. But it turns out to be quite tricky, especially in systems code, because often when programs aren't terminating, they're holding resources, and so if you remove them, 
now you don't know what to do with resources. So the, the how I got into termination actually is um, talking to people on the Windows kernel team, and they were trying to, for the Windows, um, say, Vista days, they were trying to add a feature that allowed you to remove, and the, the problem is, is that um, if the, if the um, device driver wasn't terminating, they couldn't implement that mechanism. So they wanted, um, they wanted to know, they wanted to find the termination nodes and device drivers. Okay, no more questions? Thank you, thank you very much.